I had, I had a big whiteboard on my wall in my office and it was like filled with deals. And it would, I would have X's on the whiteboard and it would literally go from like, you know, application to every, every step of the process. And like every day I was crossing them off because all of them were dying. So at that point I, I knew it was, you know, you can, I was working twice as hard, I was closing half the deals. And I was like, what am I doing? And I went to my boss at the time, my brother's best friend, Mike. And I said, Mike, what are we doing here? And he was like, yeah, you know, I don't know, man. I think that this might be it. And uh, we both packed up and we both moved home. Dude, we all have the best time ever to start a small business. If I'm not gonna be 100% in, I'm not gonna do it. Come on, man, just be yourself. Yeah, and, well, and just show up as yourself. If you don't realize what I'm really about, I'm about freedom, family, and my country. Steven, cheers. Cheers, brother. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming on. Sure. I, uh, I sh for a little bit of homework, or housekeeping, I should say, I always mix it up. <laughs> this show was started based on me coming up, being a troubled kid, being someone who maybe didn't have people welcoming him in to help as easily because I was a chippy uh, kid. And at times I, I still am, I'm not perfect. Right. And not having enough people helping while I'm trying to run. And I said, as soon as I have a little bit of success, I'm gonna turn around and help people. So long story short, we were doing this local mentorship. Evan was kind enough to come help me start filming that. And he said, why don't we just interview your friends and clients and people you know, your network around your fire pits. Cool little setup. I've been thinking about doing it myself. I said, that's a great idea. I do it every weekend anyway. So this is really about the courage to go out there and chase down what you want and having those people who are watching this get some free information. And Mike Scalfani, a great friend of yours, introduced us. I think Mike's a really good guy. Uh, he has CKO as a, as a realtor as well. Yeah. Does a lot of business out in Monmouth County. Mm -hmm. He had said, this guy is unafraid to go do things. He's jumped from Lehman, from the mortgage business, over to owning multiple gas stations, a CKO himself. And you were doing that for your freedom. You were sick and tired of punching the clock. Yep. And I said this almost exact thing last week, but that is like what the show is all about, is leaving the corporate world and going into freedom, or leaving the corporate world going into a sales organization, which provides more freedom and flexibility. So your story embodies all that. Sorry for the run on, but no. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you, thank you for having me. Again, this is uh, it's very cool. Yeah, Mike is uh, Mike's a great guy. He's a great friend. I mean, I don't want to pump him up too much. His head's gonna his head's gonna blow up. But he's Mike, already got big big heads on yeah, the billboards. Yeah, he's got the bobblehead. That's it. He's got the big bobblehead. He's all over. He's got billboards and everything. He's all over the place, you know. But uh, yeah, Mike is he's been a great friend for years. So you know, shout out to him, Mike Scafani. Um, but yeah, he's not wrong. I, you know, I, I think that. For a while, I was afraid, and I, I thought that, you know, I had to go work for, you know, these big companies and try to, you know, climb my, my way to the top and, and climb the corporate ladder. And really, I was just doing what I thought I needed to do. I wasn't doing what I, what I was truly meant to do or what was going to make me happy. Um, and not until I got older and matured, I realized that, you know, like, killing myself for these big corporations and these big companies, you know, it wasn't the answer. You know, I, I wanted I wanted to be in business for myself, and I wanted to call my own shots. I thought I had the chops to do it. I thought I had the smarts to do it. And uh, you know, I come from a long line of entrepreneurs. You know, my father's been a business owner. He's in the collision business. I learned a ton from him. You know, I think I'm a hard worker. He's a hard worker times ten thousand. You know, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I'm grateful to have had that that knowledge from him and and that in home training from him to you know to for lack of better words, to grab my balls and just do what I wanted to do. The work ethic. Oh, yeah. The work oh. ethic is automatically instilled when you see your parents. Evan no and I let Colton come out here. Evan's more patient than I am because I don't want to pay for these cameras if he breaks them. <laughs> but he's, he's seeing this every week, right? He's, he's doing that. So you're constantly instilling that work ethic in your children. And Absolutely. obviously, you picked it up from your parents. So Absolutely. I want to walk through your life a little bit before sure. we get too much into business and what you've done. Grew up in Marble, went to Marble High School. Where'd yeah. you go to school? Where'd you go to college? Uh, University of Delaware. Delaware. Delaware's a cool school. Delaware's great. How'd you like that? I loved it. I was, uh, you know, it's fine. Were I you mean, a good student? No. I, 
I was a shitty student in middle school, high school, and so my road to Delaware wasn't, <laughs> my friends will laugh because they know my, my history, my college history. I went to um, Johnson & Wales my freshman year in Providence, Rhode Island. One of the only schools I got into. Johnson & Wales is known for its culinary division, right? And people say, oh, you're going to Johnson & Wales, you know, you, you look like a chef. I was like, I'm not a chef, I'm going for business, you know? So my first semester there, I wound up doing really good because it was super easy. Got my grades up. From there, I said, I want to go to my, like a better school for business, and I really wanted to go to Delaware. I didn't get in out of high school. So that's where I really wanted to go. You wanted to go to Dewey Beach. I wanted to go to Dewey Beach, Rehoboth. <laughs> Rehoboth and Dewey Beach, that's right. And Delaware was in like Playboy for like the hottest girls, so of course I wanted to go. <laughs> um, Are we know. allowed to talk about Playboy? I guess so. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic publication. Why not, right? <laughs> Rest in peace, Hugh Hefner. Um, but, uh, but, you know, Delaware had just, it had a better school, had a better name, and, you know, I really, you know, when I was a kid, I, I wanted to be an investment banker. This is how dumb and immature I was. I didn't even know what the fuck an investment banker did. I just knew they made a lot of money, and I wanted to be in, like, corporate finance. You know, so I knew that I needed to go to a better school, maybe potentially business school, and that's really where I had my, my eyes set on. And I got into Delaware immediately, right after my first semester. Um, but I didn't go right away. I came home. I went to Brookdale for, I think, a year and got my grades up even more, did great there. And then finally, that following year, I went to Delaware. And um, I did well enough there. I did okay. I didn't do great, you know, but, you know, I think my GPA was like a 2.5, 2.7, something like, you know, not. How'd you, how'd you feel that, like, so I, I, I took a hard stance on college years ago, like, you don't need college, and that was to pump myself up. You don't need college, you could go be successful. Like, right. I'm this guy who was booted out of high school, had an IEP, and then all of a sudden, like, I find this hyper focus in the finance world, and I'm sitting down with people worth five million bucks, 10 million bucks, and more yeah. at times, and I'm like, they don't, you don't need college. But I have had a mixed thing. So Andrew, who I had on last week, if uh -huh. you haven't heard his episode, Man in the Arena, it, the law firm, Zimmer Law yeah. Firm. Yeah, I was, I was I was listening to it. I was watching it, listening to it on my way here. As a matter of fact, great guy, but he had a, a very sad childhood, like from elementary, middle school, and high school, in a sense of like he felt pretty lonely. Yeah, you know, he was yeah, kind of felt left, bad when I heard that. Yeah, he was kind of left out and things and stuff. And college to him was this fresh new start. Like, I am a cool dude. I am yeah. kind of bad. I am smart, and it gave him this whole new life before he set out on his career. So. Uh, I, my my run on here is what, what did you think of college and besides the party aspect did you really think it was a true value add and it, did it really open the doors to what you jumped into after yes and no right so at that time if you didn't you know i'm 39 and a half ish i'm gonna be 40 in october october 9th so i'm hanging out to my 30s for as long as i can but um, at that time, going to school, if you didn't, you know, we're talking 20 years ago, if you didn't go to college, you know, something's wrong with you, why aren't you going to college? You know, if you're not going into the family business, why aren't you going to college? Mm. Now it's much more understood and, and now it's a lot more, it's, it's okay not to go to school, not to go to college. It's okay to not start your life out with $150,000 debt. It's true. To do nothing. And to give a shout out to my father, uh, again, five kids, he paid for all of us to go to school. So I'm blessed in that regard that I never had college debt. My father put five kids through school and um, he did Shout out to Allstate. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. State Farm, Allstate. That's it, exactly. We appreciate you. you sure. They got to put uh, your dad on that commercial. Yeah, right. <laughs> he's, a, he's a little too Brooklyn for the for the for for the airways, I think. So is that where your pops grew up? Yeah, I was born in Brooklyn, and uh, how long were you there? I, w I was there till I was about six or seven, yeah. and uh, he still has his body shop in Brooklyn, and he goes to work every single day. Still goes up. To how old is he? Dude, he's like sixty-four, and he. he do you think he's bored and you just don't want to hang out with your mom? I mean, shout uh, out to no, mom. I know you're the best. Well, no, my mother will, will fucking kill him yeah, if she she, she home. sends him out. She she tells him to go. And he he my father legitimately loves what he does. Like he absolutely loves what he does. He he paints he paints cars every day in the shop. Mm -hmm. Like he's the boss and he's literally he's the painter. Mm -hmm. I said, Dad, why don't you just hire a painter? Oh, then I got to pay this guy, and then you know, I, I could say you know how much money I'm saving. And nobody paints like me anyway, Steve. You know, and for people who know my dad, who are listening and watching, you know, they they understand his mentality. And um, but back to him being the hardest worker I ever met in my life. He um, 
I, I don't even know where we were going with this. Yeah. I'm, you're, now I'm running off. But, um, <laughs> this but is what this is school. all about. That's it, man. Exactly. It's all about. But you school, were in school. What, yes. You know, the value and I, and I thanked at. him for the, for the, for the, the hundreds of thousands of dollars in education. But um, do I think it was worth it for that? Yes and no, because yes, because it's, it gave me a little bit more of, it polished me up a little bit, you know, gave me a little bit more knowledge on certain things. Would I have been fine without it? Sure. I would have been just fine without it. I'm a little bit more sh- like street smart, mm-hmm. I think, and I have. I think that what's good for me. I think my my advantage is that I have the street smartness, and I have you know the book smart too end of it, mm-hmm. um, where you know I'm a, it's a good combination. Um, I didn't take advantage of it while I was there because I was so hyper focused on getting out. I didn't want to be in school. Yeah, I wanted to get the fuck out. Go work. I wanted to go make money, you know, and. Um, and that's all I could think about. I didn't really enjoy it. The weekends, like, I, I, I remember I would purposely pick my classes so I had no Friday classes, not so I could just hang out and have fun, because on Thursday nights, you go home. I would drive home and I would bartend at a bar in Jersey um, because I had a really good bartending job and I was making more money there than I could in Delaware just at, at some bar there. So I would do that pretty much every weekend. So and you got some of Mama's cooking. I got, she did my laundry. You know, I had macaroni on Sunday. You know, I spent more time at Rutgers hanging out with my Rutgers friends. That they, uh, people thought I went to Rutgers because I was like in the area, um, but I was just home on the weekends. So, so after you got out of school, what did you get into? What were you doing career-wise? What was that first career step? First job was at uh, at a mortgage company in Marlboro. And um, mortgages were big. A lot of people were making Give a ton a of money. Give us a year. Give us a year. What year was this? This is 2005. 2005. I got out of school and uh, came back home. I didn't get into, uh, I didn't get any big uh, investment firm offers, which was a, was a sad thing. But I was like, all right, what am I going to do now? I have to go figure out what I'm going to do. A couple guys I knew were making a ton of money in the mortgage business. I was like, great. What's your, start, what's your starting salary? They're like, oh, no, no, we don't pay a salary. I was like, what do you mean? They said, this is commission only. I was like, well, like benefits? No, no, nothing. You're like 21, 22. Yeah, I was fresh out of school. I needed to make money, yeah. you know? Um, I was like, okay, uh, how, do you guys, how do you guys do this? And, you know, I, I, learned, I learned a little bit. And um, from there, I kept bartending on the weekends to kind of support myself in the very beginning while I learned the business. And... Um, it was uh, and very. And that's okay, by the way, for people who are watching. That's a great, it's totally fun, hidden nugget. I, I did the same thing. Uh, a buddy of mine, his brother-in-law owned an electrical company, and I would run wire. I didn't know anything about being an electrician, but I was doing manual labor, or yeah. I was picking up, you know, a, a snow plowing job and just shoveling sidewalks or whatever I could do in the beginning of my sales career because you know commissions. You got to hustle, man. You got to build what you a pipeline. Do. Listen, I'll, you know. And I very much have the mentality of, you know, like I'll shovel shit for money, man. I'll, I'll do whatever I have to do, yeah. you know, to provide for myself now, for my family. Um, you know, and there's no shame in it. You know, um, there really isn't. And if you think that you're above something or above some job, you know, well, that's, that's your problem. But me, I'll, I'll, whatever I got to do, you know, scratch and claw to, to get by and make ends meet, I'm, I'll do it, man. I, I didn't care. And I wasn't, you know, bartending was fun. It's not like boohoo, poor yeah. me. You know, I wasn't cleaning toilets. Yeah. I was, I was hanging, hanging out with fun. girls, hanging out with your buddies. Kidding me? I was killing it, you know. And yeah. and my friends would come and see me, and you know, I was making a lot of cash doing it. So it was all good. So uh, I learned the business, and I was there for about two years. My brother's best friend, um, Mike Ratner, who owns um, in the area Atlantic Plumbing Supply. Shout out to Mike Ratner. Um, Is that the guy in '71? He's on 34. He's on. He's in Long Branch. I've seen it. I've seen on the 30, on 36 the in Long Branch. Yeah. Um, Tell him to get on the show. Yeah, I will. I'll get him on. He's a good dude. And uh, he became. He, as time went on, he became a bit of a mentor for me as well. Um, he moved to California, he moved to Los Angeles to be an actor like years earlier, and he wound up forgetting about acting, and got into the mortgage business as well out there. And I remember speaking to him, and he was like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, I'm working mortgage. He's like, great. He's like, how many deals are you closing a month? I was like, a month? I'm doing maybe like one every two months or something like that. He's like, what? He's like, Stephen. It's 2005, man. He's like, get the fuck out of here. You can sell a mortgage to a dog. That's it, exactly. (laughs) He's like, come to California. He goes, I swear to you, I promise you, I will not let you fail. I was like, sweet. He needed a body. What's that? A handsome body that could just talk. That's it. He needed another gun in his... uh, 
in his, uh, in his, Holster. In his yeah, there you go. So anyway, he's like, come out, you know, visit for a weekend, see if you like it first. And if you like it, I'll introduce you to my partner and we'll get you, we'll get your own. It's like, fine, fuck it. I booked the trip. I went out and mind you, in the back of my head, I loved the idea of LA because I, as a kid, I wanted to be an actor like badly. That was my thing. Ah, fuck it. You know, maybe I'll take it to do a couple of auditions while I'm out there too. Maybe it'll, something will pan out. I go out there, I have a blast. He shows me a good time. I felt like a college like recruiting trip. So wait, hold on, you were trying to do acting? I mean, like, uh, you know, it was in my mind, right? Like, I was going out to work for him. Did you ever actually try out for anything? No, I never got any Tell auditions. The truth. I didn't, I didn't. And um, I didn't give it enough time. And I think that, you know, I love film, I love acting, I love movies. And um, So you've seen Basil Iwanek that was on the dude, show? Dude, hey, great interview, man. Basil was awesome. I was very impressed. He was nervous was, for that a little bit. He was? I was. Oh, I was. Oh, I, he was. I shit, I was to yeah. say. Um, yeah, I mean, you, I mean, you did a great job, but he, what an impressive story, man. Yeah. What an impressive guy. Uh, and he seemed just cool. Very down to earth. He's like, real. Spring late thing. I loved it. Loved it. That's, that's someone to aspire to be like, you know, mm -hmm. who's reached a level of success where, you know, you want to be very cool with people. So, um, so I never gave it like the, the respect that it deserved. Now that yeah, you said that, I could totally see you like a Johnny drama or like fuck yeah, man, <laughs> on the entourage. It's funny. I grew right up. Right, that's right. I grew up. In with, a good way, I grew dude. up with Jerry Ferrara, Turtle, who plays Turtle on yeah. Entourage in Brooklyn. Actually, is he from Boston? No, he's from Brooklyn, Thirteenth Avenue. Who's Diker that? Heist. Oh, Turtle. The Turtle. Little guy. Yes. 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 So, uh, and when I was out there, you know, like we hung out a bunch, and he was really cool and really, you know, it was nice knowing him out there. So, but um, you went out there. I went out there and, and the mortgages. Yeah, and it was legit like, like the room hummed, you know. Mm -hmm. And this is '05, and you walked into the office, and you know what I'm talking about when I say the hum. Yeah, like phones ringing. Yeah, you know, people just excited. Yeah, everybody suited up. Yeah, you it just yeah, you know, it's just dialing for dollars. Money's just sold. flowing through the Dude. phone. And these guys were these guys were making. Is money. that okay? Right? Is it okay that like when I used to go and call business owners to talk about their health care or their retirement plan that probably sucked because they were busy running a business. Right. Like I hammered the phones and said, hey, dude, I want to make money. Yep. Because sometimes, and I still sometimes do this, like I get this like little feeling like, am I bad because I want to make money? Like I, I want to have financial freedom for my family. And again, I don't need to be the wealthiest guy in the world and I'm not based around material things, but right. I want the whole freedom to go travel the way I want to do and live the way I want to do. Um, and when you talk about buzzing a room, I think you think about Wolf of Wall Street, you think about bad Wall Street people, you think about the bad, you know, guys that were in mortgage. And there were some. I mean, don't, there were... In anything. There, right. And there were, there were, what do there you were, think about that? And I'm, I'm going on a tangent, but... No, and that's and it's a good question. I think that my, my answer to that is that, and I mean this wholeheartedly, and this is a very, you know, very important thing for me, Capitalism is not a dirty word. Mm -hmm. And I think too many people out there think that it is. I think that too many people apologize for being successful business and sharp, shark-like business owners. And I think that's a wrong way to look at it. You know, I, yes, I wanna make a lot of money. I wanna service my clients. I wanna, I wanna do well and I wanna make, I'm sorry. I'm not, you know, I'm not sorry, I mean, yeah. is what I should say. So there's nothing wrong with that stance. There's nothing wrong with- um, Being a good guy while you're doing it yeah. and, and trying to do the right thing, not being malicious. But I, I, I get a little frustrated sometimes when people are like, oh dude, you know, that guy's just about, you know, his business or he's just, well, what is he really about? What is he after? What is his goals? For me, I want a cabin for my family to go enjoy with. Mm -hmm. I want to live in a nice home like I do, uh, which I'm blessed to live in a beautiful area in beautiful. Point Pleasant on the border of Bayhead. Like that's pretty cool. Like. I was a kid at my parents, to your dad's credit, my dad's credit, my dad worked extremely hard. Drove an oil truck all day long, cleaned offices three nights a week, and worked at a, another landscaping uh, provider driving a dump truck on Saturdays. He hustled. Yeah, dude, he hustled to give us a better living than he had. And I saw that. Like, I want to give my family a better life, but I never would have envisioned where I live today. And right. by no means do I think I have a mansion in some crazy special place. But I didn't think back then in my limited beliefs that I would be here. And I think more people, if they focused on what someone's trying to accomplish. Listen, there's a lot of bad guys in business that are just chasing money and they're taking short roads to do it. 
but there's also a lot of good people that aren't looking to hurt people Agreed. in any type of malicious way. Agreed. And we're getting we're getting off your story. No, but no, no, that's that's fine. And these are good these are good nuggets, as you say, right? Yeah. That's 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 the word. So what what were you doing? <laughs> Got a little the- chocolate out of Evan over there for that one. <laughs> <laughs> what, were, what were you doing in the mortgage business? Give us the number. What were you, what were you making a month when you were um, maxing in, out there? In 05, 06, 07, um, I was making, mind you, I was like 23. I was making like 30 to 50 grand a month. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money for a young kid. I never knew money like that, you know? And I remember thinking to myself, while wow, I was making that type of money, this can't last forever. You know, and back to your point about the good people and the bad people in business, there were guys out there that were making double, triple, quadruple is what I was making. Filthy as shit, you know, like doing yeah. bad stuff. Yeah. But the, I, I, I slept good at night, you know, yeah. like I, I was a good businessman. You know, I, I never lied to people. I was just good at my job. Mm-hmm. And that's, and it's okay to say that. I, you yeah. know, I was, I was comfortable in what I did and I, I didn't cheat people. I didn't fuck people over. And I, I still take that stance today. So no amount of money is going to ever change that. Yeah. But, um, you know, 30 to 50 grand, you know, was pretty much the number of what, what I was doing. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of money. Yeah. It was a ton of money. So, and um, So 2008 happens, though. Yeah. And that was a kick in the ass. Talk about that time in your life. You were now, what, 25, 26? Uh, yeah, it was about that. Yeah. Uh, about 25. Yeah, about 25, 26. So, oh, it happens. And again, I, I you know, I kind of said to myself, I, this can't last forever. Something's got to give. You know, you got the janitor making 60 grand a year, getting approved for a, you know, $800,000 mortgage. I was like, it just doesn't jive. It just doesn't make sense, you know? Nothing wrong with janitors, but I mean, no, economics I mean, right. I'm just using this doesn't as a, make sense. Right. I mean, you know, any, take the word janitor out. Any guy making that type of money, yeah. you know, should not be approved for that type of a financial burden, you yeah. know? Uh, so I knew that it just wasn't it just wasn't right, and but you know I was riding the wave just like everybody else, um, and then so I was a broker, I was a mortgage broker. So basically, someone would come for a loan, a refinance, a purchase, whatever, they would either take cash out of their house, change their rate, we would shop it around to different banks, different lenders, and all those lenders had reps that would come to the office, they would take us out, they would try to schmooze us because they wanted our business, and we had this one rep from a lender, and this guy was just smooth, man. He was just he got deals done. He was just he was a sharp dude, um, and my man Fuzz, and he, he was just always like tailored suits, always looked good. And I was doing a deal with him, I'll never forget, and this is around the time when things started going bad. And it was just in the very beginning, I was doing a deal, and the deal closed, the three day rescission period passed to go to funding. Client calls me, the client was pulling like 100 grand out of, his, of equity in his house, I think it was like redoing something. He already started the project, like putting an extension on. Why are you looking at my roof? I know I'm, I'm just saying. Roof, no, I'm, just, I'm using it. Come as on. A, I'm using, <laughs> is it the gutter? I got. Or no. is it that wind thing? I got. I got a couple of good contractors. She's for you got you nice need. boobs on her. The, the mermaid. Yeah, she's got great man. She's, <laughs> that's what I'm checking out. <laughs> so um, I didn't install that. It was the previous owners. <laughs> no, 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 listen, it's, it's fun. You can, I gotta you, leave it though. My wife wants to take it down. I like it. No, I'll leave it there. It's fun. I mean, you got to deal with your wife, so I could, I could say, you know, <laughs> leave it there and not, not have any trouble. But, uh, so, so the, the funding period came and the guy was like, all right, we started a project. When am I getting the money? I was like, oh, I should hit your account tomorrow. Tomorrow comes, no money. Next day, no money. Guy's freaking out. I call my rep. I go, Fuzz, what's going on? Dead silence. Fuzz, you there? Like, it gives me chills to even, like, repeat the story because I remember it like it was yesterday. He goes, Stevie, it's over. I said, what do, you, what do you mean it's over? He's like, it's over. It's like, it's done. Everything's done. Like, I'm going to jail. No, no, right. <laughs> He's like, everything's done. It's over. The, like, now, you didn't and, see what was going on, or that was just... It was the, in the very beginning. It was like, this was one of the first lenders that really like, took a hard hit. I think they were, because they were a subprime lender. So he must have got some type of... The loan didn't fund and something ran happened. Downhill and, some ran downhill, and he, he, was, he knew it. And um, he's like, this guy's loan is not going to fund. Do you He's still not, talk to this guy at all? Um, yes, like through social media. Awesome guy. Like What's he, he doing ha- nowadays? <sighs> See, I'm always I think he's curious. doing real estate. I forget exactly, but like every now and then we'll hit each other up. Awesome guy. Like still, like I never, it was not his fault by any stretch. Of course. There's things out of his, out of his uh, control, but um, still a great, great guy. And I, I loved him. Um, but I had to deliver, excuse me, I had to deliver that bad news to the client and the guy like had to freak out. And then literally like, I had, I had a big whiteboard on my wall in my office, and it was like filled with deals. And it would, I would have X's on the whiteboard, 
and it would literally go from like, you know, application to every, every step of the process. And like every day I was crossing them off because all of them were dying. So at that point I, I knew it was, you know, you can, I was working twice as hard. I was closing half the deals. And I was like, what am I doing? And I went to my boss at the time, my brother's best friend, Mike. And I said, Mike, what are we doing here? And he was like, yeah, you know, I don't know, man. I think that this might be it. And uh, we both packed up and we both moved home. What year was that? It was 08. 08, yeah. yeah. That's when it was just yeah. and, and financial uh, Armageddon in a sense, especially for the mortgage industry. Scary. Yeah. Very scary time. You, you know, came was, out with Harp, Tarp, Harp, Harp after that. Yep, and yep. A lot more right. general restrictions on the mortgage. It game. went from, it went there from. There was some crazy no doc loans and some crazy things going on. Like in my space, I have so much compliance. They barely like to let me do this right. podcast. And thank you, compliance, for allowing me to do it. Uh, shout out to compliance. Yeah, shout out to compliance. <laughs> uh, Julie. Um, I'm so heavily regulated and like, and this is, this is 08, I started in 07. So when 08 happened, I'm like, oh shit. Walk around the office like, you know, the guy, again, I've said this a couple times with the biggest watch and the nicest car, he's like hiding under his desk, not answering <laughs> his phone. He don't got an answer what happened right now. He's like, uh, I got C-share, mutual funds. I don't know. I'm collecting 1%, you know. <laughs> so I was always amazed that they were allowed to get away with that. With, with mortgages, and that was something that was Bill West. Clinton put into place because he thought that everybody should be able to have the American gene, own a home, have a white picket you, fence. You put the responsibility of people's own, how do I say this? Like, you gave people the responsibility to be, to seek advisors, in a sense, because we were mortgage advisors, right? They would seek advisors, and you told the advisor, hey, the shittier the product you sell this person, the more money I'm gonna pay you. Yeah. It, it, was, it was a bunch of irresponsible people doing irresponsible things. And they hired anybody. And they hired anybody. I, didn't, yeah. I had, no, I had no, no background, really. Mm-hmm. I was an economics major in college, you know? And it was sales. Yeah, but really school and actually on-job training are very different. You needed no certification. Like, there was no, you didn't even need a real estate license to sell a mortgage as a broker. Or as a, uh, you know, work for a broker. I would say, but um, yeah, it was, you know, it was extremely loose. And then after everything kind of crumbled, it went to extremely tight. So, so it went from one extreme to the other. Moving the story along. Sorry. Um, no, 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 it's, it's, I just, I've asked these questions. So thank you for giving us color and context. Sure. I just want to make sure I can crunch in you know, a lot of what you've done. You've done a lot of stuff and yeah. you've been unafraid to take risks. Like I said earlier, you then come back, you hook up again with Mike Scalfani. He's getting way too much publicity tonight. He's going to owe us a I'm, check or a I'm free boxing you. round or something. Um, you reach out to him. He's I told him at- today, by the way, he should count his blessings that I'm in his life. I'm the best thing that ever happened to him, <laughs> and he knows it. So, Jumping back in here, you got a new friend What's up, huh? sitting next to you. That's Hudson. That's it. He's, got he's a, from Russia. He's got good instinct. He's Putin. I know everybody's mad at the world. Putin's a bad Russia. word right now, but he is from Russia and he's a please, sweet boy. Please, well, my my current uh, my current job and lifestyle, people think that I'm affiliated with that too. So it's all good. good well, company, you do look kind of like Middle Eastern a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the uh, it's the olive skin, man. It's summertime. So we were talking about Mike. We're about to give Mike some more credit. Which is you crazy. Ca- you, you, yeah, we're giving him too much credit. You Wait came back. And you were looking for a job. He was yeah. in the accounting department. He had already been kind of demoted in a sense. Well, yeah, he Liam, was. Uh, Lehman Brothers already had kind of gone through a bankruptcy. And what most people don't realize, when you're that large, you can't just shut down the business. Yeah, you Lehman, have to go Lehman filed with like $60 billion in assets. So yeah. you can't just turn the lights off the next day. It's, it takes time to unwind. And there's a lot of like, you know, accounting and tax purposes and, and things like that, which, you know, you have to go through and... Um, and it's a process, and it's like years of process. So Mike was just getting, uh, you know, started into a really good role in a front office um, in the energy group, I think. And then everything happened. Everything kind of like fell apart. And then he went back to his roots in, I think, payroll and uh, worked for a great guy. And which eventually, when I came home, I was panicked. And I went to Mike immediately, and I said, please, you know, reach out to John, our his, his then an hour managing director and see if he can help me out and he did he came through which a lot of people don't do and you know, everybody 
everybody's, a lot of people are, you know, for the most part, worried about themselves and their own family. And, you know, it's, for a lot of people, it's a burden to, to do things for others in that regard. And I don't want to come across the wrong way when I'm saying that, but like, it's, you know, people have their own problems, you know? Well, I, I thought about it the other day when my daughter was in the hospital. Not that we told a million people and asked for any type of help, but people have their own jobs they need to go to. They have their own bills. Yeah. And life must go on. You must grow through your troubles. And at the end of the day, we had Kelly's family who was overly helpful to us. Um, Big Maddie, our our friends, uh, Phil and Kelsey, Trevor and Dami. That's awesome. Uh, They they were very helpful as well as, you know, Don and a bunch of my other friends. I don't leave anybody out. They that knew about it. We didn't tell everybody. But I knew they had their own things going on. Every single one of them. And if you don't recognize that you're really in this game, rat race world by yourself, meaning you and your family or close friends, you're not paying attention. Yeah, and, and you know he he came through for me. He got me a job there in um, in the account their accounting department, and um, you know we were unwinding a bankruptcy, so it was a it was a pretty laid back scene. So I went from you know the mortgage industry to now working on a bankrupt investment firm, which is kind of ironic. And um, what'd you learn there? It was a completely different vibe from what I was used to. Um, I learned how to have like a kind of a real corporate job. If that makes any sense, you know, I, I was like a, I was a gunslinger in in California, and I was just party all night, sling dude, deals I, yeah, all day. That's it, man. I was I was a, I was a gunslinger in a three piece suit every day. Like like who like who the fuck I thought I was? I was yeah. I was I was going to work in a three piece suit like it was the Wolf of Wall Street. But yeah, I'm the man. That was the that was the vibe, man, and that was the that was how it was. And then I got to Lehman, and it was okay. You know, you have a a VP of your group, and. You know, you, you have to report to him, and this is, you know, it's a much more structured environment. And I learned how to be in that structured environment and how to kind of go up that chain of command. Um, and it was good. I learned a lot. I worked with some really great people. I worked for some great people, and uh, I'm grateful for it. And I want to give a shout-out to people working in the corporate world. Sometimes I seem to give it a bad name, and there's a lot of people who provide very great lifestyles and income for their family working yeah. within corporate America. But my overall opinion on them is the people at the tippy tippy top who own and control them have in, in a sense enslaved the people of the world for their own greed. Yeah. And you know they have taken away flexibility and freedom. But a lot of people in there are very intelligent. They've made a lot of money. And there's something to be said about that corporate structure that as a business owner, gunslinger to use your word, you know, you never went and found that P and L. You never went and ran, you know, that, that that VP and what he has to report on. That reporting you have to kick up to him. That does teach you a lot. So I want to make sure I get across. I'm not hating on anybody in corporate America. No. There's a lot of very smart men and women in that space. To that point, I wasn't sm- I wasn't as smart as those people were in that regard. You know, I I'm not wired that way. I just mm-hmm. wasn't. You know, I remember. After Lehman, when I went to the first hedge fund that I worked at, hedge fund and private equity firm, I'll never forget. I was just like I would be in the kitchen, and these firms, they you know, they they would give you the world. They would, you know, you walk in the kitchens, and there was like seven different types of milks and and anything that you could ever want because they didn't want you. They wanted you there all the time. They wanted you comfortable. But the the type of brain capacity that these people have, I would never ever. I would hear them just talking. These are Harvard Business School, Harvard Law de- degree people, like on a completely different level that I do what I do now because I I couldn't I couldn't do that. I'm not wired that way. You yeah. know? And nothing wrong with that. And I, I, I admire that. I really do. I, I look up to that. I think that's a, a beautiful thing. It's just it just wasn't me. You know, and it wasn't who I thought I could be. And I wouldn't last in that in that ring, you know. How long were you there? At the hedge fund? Mm-hmm. So after I left Lehman, I was at Lehman for like five years. I went to that first hedge fund. I was there for about two, two and a half years. Um, and then I got a new, a new, I went to a new, it was more private equity based, the other, the other firm. So, talk, g- give us your opinion for someone who may be watching, a younger person or someone our age that's just not familiar with it. Um, talk a little bit about the difference of a hedge fund and private equity. Sure. Uh, private equity is more of, um, let's see, so private equity, for example, let's say you have a distressed company, um, P.F. Chang's, let's say. You know where they AMC. have. What's that? AMC. That's right. <laughs> AMC. Toys R Us. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> My wife used to work for Toys R Us, as a matter of fact. Ironically, 
and TR in um, in Wayne at their corporate office. She's a buyer. So, um, but um, yeah, like these these companies that are distressed companies, they need you know there's there's different types of ways that a private equity firm can come in. They could either invest just capital, or they can invest capital and they can do management. Like it's called control or non-control. Um, most of them do a controlled um, stake because they they want full control. They want full control. They want to be able to make those decisions. They're really just levering you. Yeah. So any assets that you have, they're just saying, all right, we have a higher rate of return over here, so we can lever each dollar, let's say six to ten times. It's yep. called the velocity of money. Yep. And they come in and just pretty much bankrupt your company. Pretty on your much. Assets. I mean, you know, and <laughs> you know, private equity. Not always, but private a lot equity of gets a little bit of a bad rap um, sometimes for for some good reasons and some not. You know, I'm I'm, I'm not I'm, an expert on it, but uh, I'm a little biased to it because I I see both sides of it. You know, whereas, you know, and they'll come in, they'll trim some fat and that, you know, they'll they'll get rid of some people. You know, a lot of people will lose their jobs. Um, but at the same regard, if it wasn't for their injections and their management or whatever they're doing, they'll they can they can keep a company together for an extra five years, 10 years that they may not have even had the opportunity to. Let's say you were around 20 deals. Mm -hmm. How many deals legitimately went through? So I'm an outside investor. And I'm not giving this advice to anybody, for full disclosure, compliance-wise. But you're an outside investor, and you're saying, you know, I'm done with the traditional bullshit 401k and mutual fund space, and I have my business I've invested in. You know, I have these guys pitching me on this stock that they were able to purchase uh, off of employees that one of these companies of private equity went mm -hmm. into, and it's going to pop, and they're going to exit it. Like, how many of those deals really go through? What are, what are the the percentages that you were aware of back then? You know, I mean, that, that was a little bit more above my pay grade, but it was, it was, there was tons of conversations and there was tons of things that were trying to go through and there were some, you know, maybe half. I don't, I, you know, I really don't know for sure and I can't give you a solid number on it, but. Yeah. But it's, 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 there is a lot that lose too. Oh yeah, oh, for, without a doubt, yeah. no question. Um, it is a very interesting field. It's a very, I think the private equity side is, is definitely much more interesting. There's a lot more to it. Um, I have a couple guys that I know in the private equity space. Uh, Bobby J, Bobby Johnson. Uh, I know he tunes in here and there, as well as Frank Cardia, which is uh, one of my buddy Don Hughes's good friends and clients. Uh, just moved down here from Point Pleasant. So I'm hoping they want to come on and uh, they're not hiding from anybody. Throwing it out there, <laughs> make people, uh, make you put a little pressure on them. Yeah, I, I like to understand that more. So give us a little bit of of the hedge fund world, what is that about? Yeah, like the hedge fund is, you know, it's just basically, um, it's groups, it's it's blocks of investments, you know, blocks of investments that they, uh, they would put together and there would be different funds that would be put together at different times. And um, again, these are things that were so complex, right? Like I was, a, I was a hedge fund accountant, that was my job. So, you know, I would look at, I would look at allocations. I would look at, I would make sure that, you know, we were more compliant and, you know, and. For you would look at accounts, so like from a tax perspective? Not would, really tax or like more for turnover like, or, like or keeping hyper our, trading or. Keeping our books clean, like keeping everything like good housekeeping, whereas like, you know, Exp it would go from anything from expenses to, hey, this partner flew from New York to London, um, first class, and um, he had his dog come with him on the flight. And he had strippers on the Amex. Right. <laughs> and now your job now, and this is part of it, right? And there was other parts where I was looking at some of the stuff that they went on different trips or whatever the case was. But this is a real story. A partner, and I got to ask this in my interview too. A partner goes to London on a business trip. He brings his dog with him, buys his dog a first class ticket. He's a partner of the firm, puts everything on his business Amex. That gets kicked up to you because you know yeah. the entry level guy, whatever, has no idea what to do with it. Goes up, Steve, what do you do with it? What do you do? <laughs> so now it's my, you're telling me I have to make the decision whether I kick that expense, that $5,000 flight of his dog back to his personal account and piss off a partner of the firm. You know, and I said it's, it's, but then you have to also be. Let me ask you this, how much money was he bringing in? Was who? How much money was that guy bringing in? Oh. $30 million a year for himself, you know what I'm saying? 
no, whatever I'm it is. About, yeah, I mean, it, hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah, he, he should he should probably you know be able to get the dog a flight. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> and, that, and that was my answer. There is you know there's there's things that you look past, and there's a reason why he's in the position that he's in. And I'm not calling that guy. And I've had I've had conversations with some pretty high up guys, and I've had guys like really like give me a hard time, and you know. You know, you know who the fuck I am, and look, man. You know, I, I got a job to do. I got somebody to report to. I'm just bringing it to you. But something like that, yeah, yeah. yeah. His name's on, his name's on the wall. Yeah, yeah. I, I, he's got a pass from me. Did you ever talk to him about it later on? At a no, day? no. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> yeah. I didn't. Uh, you know, he'd be like, oh, okay. Well, what, yeah. the fuck are you? Why are yeah. you talking to me? Ken? Why are you talking to me? <laughs> go back. Go back to your desk and shut up. <laughs> Here's you know. a coffee and get me one. Right. I'm going to go to my apartment looking over the park right now, you know? So, hedge fund, private equity, how long did you go through I was in that, you know, that phase of these two industries? I was in that life, uh, the private equity hedge fund world, for uh, about five years or so. And I was getting burnt. I was getting to, you know, Lehman. How old were you when you started to get uh, burnt I was about out. 34, 35. You know, and uh, it was great. It was good money, um, and you know, like I said, they made you very comfortable. They they give you a lot of French benefits and and a lot of cool perks of the jobs, which was great. But that stuff got old after a while, you know. And um, I, I I wanted a life. I was getting really really burnt and run down, and there was the I was getting a lot of stress headaches, and you know, I just didn't like it. I I didn't like what I was doing. And at that time, I had owned the gym. I don't I I had opened CKO when I was at Lehman. CKL in Wayne, New Jersey. And um, I was going from my day job at Lehman, which is a very laid back situation, right to the gym to work. So I was getting up, I was packing my bag in the morning, I was going to my Lehman job. Long day, from, dude. It was a huge, very long day. I wasn't getting home until after midnight every night. But I loved what I was doing at Lehman. I mean, at, at, like in that part of my life. Like I loved the gym, I loved just opening it, I loved starting a business. It would be 11.30 at night, every, everybody would be gone. You know, I'd have music playing, I'd be mopping the floor. Music on, dancing, singing. I yeah. love being Pumped there. about it, yeah. Like, just, I was building something. And, um... It's a special feeling that happens when you flip that switch. Completely. And I, I was scared. To, I, I try was, to describe that to people. I was scared hard. to death. And I was supposed to go in business with Mike Sclafani and our other best friend, Mac Angelosi. He shot to Mac Angelosi, who owns Jersey Freeze and Freehold. Um, and they were partners, and his younger brother, Anthony. They were partners in Freehold, and I was supposed to go into it, and I got cold feet at the end, and I got scared. And they wound up building like the best CKO like in the whole country, pretty much. And I was like, guys, I'm ready to come in. They're like, hey, yeah, we don't need like, hey, go shit in your hat, pal. So I opened up Wayne by myself, and I remember I was going back. Don't be gun shy. Do not be gun shy. Definitely don't. And I, I'll never forget. I was so scared, and I was talking to Matt Cangelosi on the phone. I said, ah, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know. And it, for those of you who know Matt, and you know his demeanor and the way he speaks, you know he's. You, know, you can live 10,000 lifetimes and never meet another Mac Angelos because he's that special of a person. What's and I mean so that special in a good about way. him? He's just unique, man. He don't give a fuck. He's he is he's one of the one of the greatest people in the world. And but you know he's. I'll fucking tell you off real quick. Oh, he's got no no fucking yeah. problem telling. I like you. this guy. He's got no problem telling you where fuck to go. Him and I have connected on many occasions. I, I thought he had filled out an app. We're, Matt, dude. Oh, yeah, yeah, we'll get his I'm not going to beg you, dude. But we wanna, there's a couple people giving you love. Let's get on the show. I'm dude. putting him on blast right now, so now he has no choice but to come yeah, on. I think Matt's actually soft because he's had a couple invites. Yeah, he's he's like, scared to come on. Yeah, he's, you know, he's a closet pussy, but you know, yeah. excuse yeah. my language. Listen, I, uh, I thought he'd bring me some good ice cream. Oh, he will. He'll give you the shirt off his back. He'll come here. He'll bags of, of ice cream. He'll, he'll kill you with kindness. I'm, someone brought me one of his like uh, package to go things. They're Best. like. What, what, what is that thing? It was like like a flying saucer, or like an ice cream sandwich or something. Yeah, but it was like it, it was like nothing else I've ever had. His his ice cream. He knows his business well. You know his ice cream is, you know. And Matt, what's so great about your Steve? You know, I got more cream in my ice cream than that. Uh, what about Dairy? Fuck Dairy Queen. Dairy Queen's got uh, five percent. He'll kill me for saying this. You know, he'll tell you the percentage of cream in in the in the ice cream. He, he's he's a, he's great dude. Anyway, so I was talking to him on the phone. I said, ah, you know, Matt, uh, I don't really don't know. He stopped me. He goes, Steve, grab your balls and just go for it. And that conversation, when he said that to me, I was like, okay. And I did. And I opened the gym. And um, I was going back and forth, like I said, after work. I was cleaning at night. I was teaching a class, working the desk, whatever I had to do. You were running, man. I was, I was hustling, dude. And I, and I loved it. I loved my life. But then when I went to the, the hedge fund and the private equity firms. Now, was, were you married yet at this time? or? Get married in 18. 
um, I was either engaged or we were dating or something like that. And you know, that's that's tough on any any relationship. So so you know, my wife Monica put up with a lot of shit. Um, you know, and she was helpful. You know, she's from the area, so a lot of her friends were involved in the gym and helped out and joined. So it was very very helpful. Um, but um, you know, it, it was it was a grind and it was tough. And then you know, with those other more demanding finance jobs, it was getting tougher to to manage the gym and to do those things. Enter uh, my manager of the gym, Gina Haskup, who is, a, is an amazing person. I have to give her credit because she literally, one, times got really tough for me and I, I couldn't run to the gym to teach a six o'clock class because I was in the city till 7.30 at night. She literally took the, the bull by the horns and, and ran my gym. She, she took full control. So, um, this dog's greedy for pets. I see that. I already pet you, get out of here. It's awesome, I'll man. Here, Go talk to Evan, he likes you better. <laughs> So, um, so then you, you got the CKO, you say, I'm going to go into gas stations. When did you first? So I got burnt out from the finance world. I was tired of it. And I said, I need to find, um, other businesses and, or something else to do. Cause this, this travel into the city, I was working in Midtown East, living in Hoboken. And I was like, Oh yeah, I live in Hoboken. It'll be, it's three miles from where my office is. There's an hour commute each, each day, you know, on the East side of Manhattan and it sucked, you know, and I hated my life. So I, I started researching. Isn't that crazy? It's crazy. You could be in Hoboken. Wild. And it's still an hour commute into the Throw a city. rock and hit Manhattan from, Ho from Robo yeah. Hoboken. Not really, but yeah, you, get the, you get the point. But um, I was hating my life and I just, I wasn't happy. You know, I got to a point where I was just miserable and I was killing myself. And um, so I started doing some research on, on different industries and businesses that I can own for myself that I can make a tr smooth transition to where I was at a point where I was, you know, I was married or just married and I couldn't afford to start from scratch again. So I needed to, um, I needed to transition into an existing business that was already making that type of an, of an income. Um, and so I started doing research. My father used to always say, oh, I want a gas station, I want a gas station. And Why? You know, he just always liked the idea. He's in, like I said, he was in the collision business and I think that he just always liked the, the, the idea of the gas station. Like I don't an know. old school sicko or something. Yeah, like, you know, I just, I guess because it was, a, you know, you see the, the attendance with like a knot of money, you know, you think that they're making a lot of money. So um, I started researching gas stations, you know, and I started looking them up and I found... Um, Can I ask you a random question? Shoot. Not to incriminate you. No, please. Like, do you carry a gun on yourself or are you going to get like the concealed... I'll put, it, I'll put it this way. I have a sign on my station that says the owner of this property is armed. Nothing, nothing inside here is worth your life. And it's a picture of a, of a, of a pistol, of a gun. So I, I have a saying too that I go by and I, and I believe wholeheartedly, I'd rather, be tr uh, I'd rather be tried by 12 than carried by six. So if you come for me, you come for my family, you try to hurt me. I never ever in a million years, and I'm not a tough guy by any stretch, I never in a million years want to be in a position where I have to do something like that. But if I'm ever position. in that position, it's it's you, it's you or me. I'd rather you. Yeah. You know, I, and 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 I mean that. I, you know, I, I have family. You know, I have a, yeah. I have a two. I always son. thought that. I, I worked at Hess when I was a younger kid. I had a million jobs too. It's dog hairs everywhere. You worked at Hess. Now it's you dating yourself a little bit. Yeah, I Hess. worked at Hess on Route 88 in Bricktown. And I think literally the last week I was there, this guy Mario from Lakewood. He worked for Public Works. Mario, if you ever watch this, I, I hope this get you in trouble. <laughs> we we would have these stacks of cash, and over there by the hospital, like you had some some sketchy through traffic into Lakewood, and there was, you know, all walks of life that came into that gas oh, yeah. station. And I used to have this wad of cash on me, and certain people would roll up, and I'm like, I ain't losing my life over this stupid no ass cash. So this big storm came. I'm I'm going off script a little bit, but. And uh, Mario's like, man, I'm tired, I'm working. He goes in the back, he rips open this metal container, and he starts stabbing it with a paper clip. And all of a sudden, the whole gas station was like, <laughs> <laughs> like three minutes later, Bastard. phone rings, the manager. Son like, of a What's bitch. going on at the gas station? Like, I don't know, the power went out, nothing can come back on. I think it took him like a week to figure out what the... What the hell happened? And and you you're the type of guys that give guys like me anxiety and like I don't sleep at night. And when you look at the cameras and you're like, why not? Dude, I was away? 17, 18. I just got my white GMC Jimmy. I was young. Bastard, you are. Yeah, I was totally a bastard. 
I never you. like meant ill intent on anything. No, of course did. not. But you don't realize what it would do yeah. to, to yeah. you know. And um, but yeah, and that uh, you're right, man. There's it's shout it's, out to Mario. I never worked at Hest again. <laughs> <laughs> It's a it's a dangerous uh, it could be a dangerous situation you know and that's why you know you do drops there's a safe and uh, once you get to a certain point I'm very I'm very you know I've adopted a lot of my my corporate life into the gas station maybe which I shouldn't ask you that but but I, I just was curious it's coming no, to my head it's fine it's, it's what this is about right you know so here's my question with gas stations before we get more into the business side of it sure so like where is the profitability profitability for the gas station owner. So you got to win in some form or fashion when gas is at $6 a gallon. So there's a reason you voted for Biden. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Evan, can you turn the cameras off? I'm, I'm going to throw them into the fire right now, if you don't mind. Um, like, yeah. tell us how that works a little bit. And again, you don't sure. have to go crazy detail into your business, but no, I'm sure not. a ton of people want to know. And it Definitely. doesn't matter. They're still going to pull up to your local oil wall. You're a great guy, family man. It's it's a huge misconception, right? Gas prices are high. People think I'm getting rich. It's the complete opposite. The higher the price is, the less money I make. When prices are lower, that's when my margins get a little bit better. For the most part, my margins are the same and, and gas owners' margins are the same. And people say, oh, you're changing your prices. Prices change at a pump when costs change. Right now, everything's very volatile, you know. And you're also changing. monitored by um, what government body? Usually probably by the county. It's like weights and balances or... Weights and measures. Weights and measures. So weights and measures, they count. So it's funny, people are like, oh, you know, you're, you, know you, you stole money from it. Look, dude, the state comes down, they do inspections like every month. If you think that I'm playing with these pumps and the calibrations, you're crazy, you know? Um, so I couldn't if I wanted to. Um, but um, the misconception is that prices are so high. You know, you see these memes and it's like, it's like the guy with all the gold chains, you know, gas, gas station owners right now and, and when the prices are high. It's, it couldn't be further from the truth. You know, it's... I it, did, you were wearing a nice gold chain at the last uh, mask. Oh, my blink, right? Um, it's, uh, when, when prices are higher, everything's more expensive. First of all, labor's gone up. You know, uh, rent goes up, obviously. How much staff do you have? Um, there's usually two guys working at, at every time, but at the same, like that's the ideal thing. But um, now it's gotten so difficult to staff. Yeah. And this is across the For board. Everybody. Every yeah. industry. You know, you talk to, you talk to wealth management guys. You talk to electricians, to gas station owners, to whatever. It's it's impossible. Well, and, and people all think I think probably most likely because of social media. You see planes, trains, automobiles everywhere. People are balling. People are killing it. People Social are making money. toxic. Man. People are making money on crypto and this and that. And, you know, everything takes work. Everything takes work. And you said something earlier, which I know you, you truly mean. And one thing that I, I try to do, and I'm not perfect with, is I, I, I try to have a good bullshit detector. And uh, you said you would shovel shit to feed your family. Yeah. And some people may put their nose in the air, you know, to a gas attendant job or maybe owning a gas t a gas station. But you're obviously doing fairly well for yourself. Yeah, I'm doing okay, and I'm okay, and I'm okay with saying that. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm not embarrassed to say that. I got a nozzle in my hand every day. Mm -hmm. I literally pump. I lit literally. Yeah, you're pump the gas. one of the guys pumping gas every single day. Pumping people for ask money. my wife, "What do you? What does your husband do? He pumps gas." I tell her to tell them that, mm -hmm. just to see what they say, yeah. to see what their reaction is. I don't give a fuck. Like I don't care. Yeah. I will pump gas. I'll, I'll check someone's oil. I'll do whatever I have to do. You know, I'm running around and I still have to run the business, but it does not scare me to work hard. Yeah. And that's how that's that's how it's brought up, and that's how it should be. So, you know, being unafraid to do anything that gives you money is a is a strength, right? And there is particular things that you may be weak at. Right, so I yeah. have Mac Lewalky, who's a great operations manager for me. Um, he runs down the paperwork. He makes sure all the ducks are in a row. He makes sure all the T's yeah. are crossed and the I's are dotted. Mm -hmm. And that is needed in many businesses. Um, but with that being said, I also went out there and shovel snow, like I said I have done, and shovel shit as well to make a living for my family. I will make it work and make it happen. I think that's the entrepreneurial spirit, like this is not better per se 
than your corporate job all the time. Sometimes we gotta eat shit, sometimes we gotta shovel shit. Right. And you that's, aren't afraid that's, to- That's a great line, I, I like that, that's, that's very true. And you're not afraid to, to get in that. So I wanna talk though, CKO, that was running the whole time, COVID hits. Right. You now have how many gas stations plus CKO? Uh, that was a that was a very very difficult time because it was I was so new in the gas business where I was still learning like mind you like my my father grew up in the collision business or my father owns a collision shop and I grew up around that but like it's kind of similar but not really at all like I knew nothing about the gas business so I was learning it I had three gas two gas stations excuse me at that time I was learning the business I was working at Lehman and not Lehman I was working at the hedge fund and. Um, and I had the gym, and it was uh, it was overwhelming to say the least. You end up having like three or four gas stations, right? Three, three. Yeah. And CKO, and then COVID hits. COVID. What hits. happens to CKO? It was kind of. Thanks for reeling me back in, by the way. Yeah, yeah, no I problem. I was going off. I was going off beat. Um, COVID hits, and it's uh, complete. As most people know, it it took a lot of industries by like it crushed a lot of industries: the restaurant, bar industry, obviously, movie theaters, and the gym industry. And, you know, I was of the mindset, obviously, that at the time where a lot of people were like, no, don't go to the gym. Where, you know, I was more of the, hey, go to the gym, work out, keep some distance from each other, keep your body strong. You know, I'm the natural immunity guy where, you know, you have a healthy body, it'll fight off, you know, what it's supposed to fight off. Um, but, you know, the state of New Jersey felt a little different and we were forced to close. And, you know, you go from having a healthy membership, no pun intended, but like a healthy numbers membership to, COVID hits, and then even now you're out for months, and when you're allowed to re reopen again, even your core members that were like the the diehards, the people that yeah. were at every 5:30 a.m. They already shifted gears. They were completely freaked out. 30 days to have. They all bought over. Pelotons, right? Like they have a Peloton, so you have one in your in your uh, your your Peloton. I love guy, the Peloton. Huh? I see that. I'm dying to get one myself. Yeah, you want to try it out after the? Episode? I'd love to after a couple of you know Sam Adams and a high noon. Sweat that liquor right out. You'll hit a, 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 a top <laughs> top chart. <laughs> but um, you know, they all bought all bought Pelotons. They they started doing different things. They started shifting their workouts, and they were scared. And I, I get it. I, I understand. A lot of them were older, and they were they didn't know. We didn't know what it was at the time, really. So a lot of people got spooked. So you know, I lost 100, 150 members. You know, and that's that's, that's huge, huge in the gym huge, game. Huge in the gym game. You know. Yeah. Um, and what so, were your members paying at the time? 150, 200 bucks a month? No, no. Uh, at the time, it was for a yearly membership, it was 70 bucks a month. If you wanted to do month to month with a three month minimum, it was 100 bucks a month. And uh, I think we upped it a little bit at, like around that time, so maybe 10 bucks more. So at the most, they were paying 100, 120 bucks a month. But you lose 150 members. Yeah, it's a lot. You do the math. Yeah. You know, and it's huge. And my rent wasn't cheap. I was in a strip mall in Wayne, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I didn't have a very forgiving landlord. And, um, you know, my back was against the wall and I said, I, I built, it was tough because I built such a family there and the members, the staff, like I said, you know, my manager, Gina, really, she, she was the glue that put the, it was she, she really doing was. nowadays? Gina owns a very, Gina, she's a killer, man. She's, she's a hustler. She owns a, um, a, a, an event planning business. I want to say this right. It's called Your Whimsy World. And what they do is they do like a lot of like decorations, balloons, and things like that. And like now everything is big with these, you know, birthday signs and like. That's the, not the girl the, that Mike introduced me that bought a place off no, Route Nine. No, that's that's and she does similar stuff. All right, but um, this is this is somebody else. Yeah. Um, but uh, she does ama amazing work. Like she's, like she's she's a little four foot eleven girl. You know, like a little petite person, she's got like a table saw, like she builds these things. She did my son's first birthday party um, and we had a Biggie theme and she made in big letters, it was all a dream. You know, like a reference to like a Biggie song. And she's- she's Your son likes Biggie? What's that? Your son likes Biggie? He's born on May 21st, which is Biggie's birthday. All right. So I like Biggie, I'm a big, I'm a, I was a Biggie fan. Yeah. So- um, Did you watch the P. Diddy uh, documentary? I did. The recent one? I did, yeah. I watched it twice. I thought it was really cool Yeah. Uh, to see that story of a guy who came from obviously the ghetto mm -hmm. of, of New York and then grow this whole team. And obviously him and I walk very different paths, but I felt a lot of similarities. To Biggie or, or P. Puffy. Diddy? Puffy, yeah. yeah. P. Diddy, yeah, like his yeah. story. Very of, cool story. Yeah, like just this 
this grit and determination and get out of the hood and make money and push back on the government and freedom. He talks a lot about freedom. He didn't let anybody tell him that he couldn't do it, you know? Yeah, a lot of people was, and that and I think that and he that, was misunderstood a lot. Yeah, and I yeah. think and I think a lot of like something like that goes with what's going on now, like with inflation and all this other crap that's going on in the world. Like people are, are using, well, you know, nothing I can do, you know, and I heard about you you talk about this to your credit on a recent episode where you're like I think you said something about putting like like a dog in your mouth and you're like ripping it apart. Yeah. You're not letting those ex- those things handcuff you. Yeah, you, you know, you're you're attacking them. One of the most I won't just single him out, but most very successful wealthy people make money during recessions Agreed. because they pounce Absolutely. on those things. So it's like I, I always give that analogy of like Emmett Smith, he was a great patient runner or like Barry Sanders as well and he would look behind the, the big line of Larry Allen and all these guys, and he would find that hole and explode through it. That's the same thing during a recession. Like, yep. put that thing in your mouth like a dog, just rip it apart a toy, and, and look for that hole that you can go explode through and find you know, a lot of success during a recession, a lot. And it's not to pay you, again, a lot of the work we're doing as entrepreneurs or business owners, it's paying us later. Yep. It may pay us a little bit of like paying our bills money now, a little bit of cash flow now. Grind now to pay off later. The big, the big exits always later. And however that comes, it may you know come in different ways. But I agree with that very much. You're, you're doing the work that you, you get paid for later. I totally agree. So yeah. you, you shut down CKO, COVID crushed you as well as a lot of other gyms, so you sh- shouldn't feel bad about that at all. You still had three gas stations. How did you get down to two? Did you sell one? Yeah, um, so it got to a point where I'm, I'm the only owner and uh, I'm the only operator, really, of these three stations. I, I don't have, like, you know, managers, really, or, you know, my, brother's, my brother owns a litigation support firm. You know, he's got a law degree. My sisters are in, you know, pharmaceutical um, the representatives. You know, like, I don't have, I have a lot of siblings, and a lot of family and friends, but none of them are running to. They won't pump gas. They're not pumping gas at me. Yeah. They have their own lives, their own families, and their own, their own shit to deal with. So it's just me. And, you know, my stations were in Howell, Tom's River, and Wall. And it got to a point where, with the staffing issues, where it was so difficult to find people that it was, you know, the phone, the phone rings every single morning. And the phone, when you're a business owner, the phone is not ringing at 5.30 in the morning for your staff or anybody to say, hey, good morning. You know, it, everything's going great today. I just want to let you know. Yeah, it's a fire. It's a fire, man. And, and I joke with people. People say, what do you do? I say, I'm a fireman. No, and I have all the respect for firemen in the world. I heard this same joke today that you're about to use from another guinea. Go ahead. <laughs> from another guinea. <laughs> I will pay you if you don't edit that out. Why the fuck would I edit it out? <laughs> I love the guineas, dude. Great meatballs, great subs. That's it, man. Frank's Pizza. There's nothing like macaroni on a Sunday morning when you're hungover or fried meatballs smelling Friday, uh, Sunday morning when you're dude, hungover. Dude, I'll stick with the basics. Chicken parm, man. That's it, babe. Smother some sauce and some mozzarella cheese. Not like an Irishman talking about, talking about classic Italian as chicken parm. I bet you like the Olive Garden, too, don't you? I actually used to love the breadsticks and salad. It was absolutely, and the meatball sandwich was delicious. Great. They got rid of that years ago. I don't really know much about that, but I'm, I'll take your word for it, though. What, what am I supposed to say? Gravy, sauce? What did I say wrong? I it's can't sauce. call it chicken parm? It's sauce. Gravy's brown. What did I say wrong about chicken no, parm? No, chicken parm's fantastic. My mother makes a great chicken parm. Well, what do you want? Like chicken castor? No, like, no, what, no. What's the meals you like? No, they, the, we, that's another episode. You know, we can uh, go on, uh, on my mother's cooking and all that. But, um, we got where were we? <laughs> <laughs> this podcast is fucked up. That's it's great. I love it. We, are, like, we uh, don't know what we're doing and we're just living. It's fucking awesome. Man. So you can't get staff. Can't get staff. I'm th- there's three stations. I'm, you know, I, I, tell, I tell people that I, I get ripped out of my sleep in the morning. And Mike Scafani, who another sh- shout out for him, but that he doesn't deserve, he laughs at me when I say that. Oh, rip from your sleep, rip from your sleep. It's literally the phone, the phone rings at 5.30 in the morning almost every day. And it's, this is going on, this is wrong, what do we do? And when you jump, that jumping out of your sleep in the morning to like answering a phone, like, you know, stressed out, like, okay, like, how do yeah, I? What's going on? It, it's stressful, man, it's tough. Yeah. So it got to a point where it was like, okay, I'm getting up every single day and I'm, I'm the fireman because I'm putting a fire out wherever I gotta go. And I have to, my, there's nothing, there's nothing say scheduled. Say the joke you were going to say before. No, I said, the joke was, I, I, people ask what I did, I said, I'm a fireman because I wake up every day and I just put out fires, <laughs> you know. And um, 
The, I, I love the one firemen. I heard today actually was, if I wanted to be a firefighter, I want to, I would have went to fire school. Right, right. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah. Same thing. So um, there, it got to a point where it was so difficult to manage three. And again, Howell, Wall, Tom's River. These aren't right next to each other. You know, you're 20 minutes apart from of each course. one, half hour apart from each one. You know, summer traffic, you're dealing with the parkway traffic. AJ yeah. from Thrive, who I love to death, shout out to Thrive. He doesn't realize the extra distance he moved for me is a long, it's a long ways away during the middle of your day. Yeah. Like the extra, you know, call it five or seven minutes after I'm already driving 15 to 18 minutes is now I'm into the 24, 25, yeah. 26 minutes to get to you. That's a long way. So Dude, when you're in Hoboken. That's what I'm saying. So you're in Hoboken. Your gas stations are also 20 minutes apart. Hoboken to Tom's River in a drive is easy. Hour 15, hour, hour 15. Yeah, that's so you have an emergency? almost impossible. So now remember, you know, the gas business is that, you know, you cannot afford, you, you, you can't close. You know, when you're not pumping that fuel, your margins are so tight, they're so small. Mm -hmm. So if you're shut down for any period of time, you're like, you're, you're, you're on the ropes, man. Like you, you cannot stop pumping that fuel out of that ground. Yeah. It's a volume game. Yeah. You know, and, and people think, oh, you know, gas stations, you know, you know they, people make, they only make, the only way you're making money selling gas is if you're pumping I don't an think, immense amount of money. I actually wouldn't look at them, just logically speaking, over the last 10 years as profitable at all. If they were, more people would be owning them and controlling them as you know, independent, say, operators right. and owners like yourself. There's di I mean, there's different, there's different ways of, you know, diving more deeper into the gas business. You know, you have branded and unbranded stations, right? I have branded stations just by chance. They're all all branded. Are they're all Luke Oils? Which now Luke Oils were what? Mobile? They were mobiles at one point, um, and then um, mobile uh, Luke Oil came in and, and kind of bought them over, and 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 now that brand is um, is all Luke Oils. But Luke Oil's main corporation, the main main hub of Luke Oil, is a Russian-based company. So are you kind of like a franchise in the That's sense? That's exactly what I am. I'm a, yeah. we're, we're in the, the gases, we're called dealers, but I'm a franchisee. That's really at the, end of the day what, at the end of the day what I am. So you gotta send them a royalty? No, no. I have to buy my fuel from Luke Oil. So Luke Oil- So they just want you to use their plant? Just use, use their, you buy the fuel from them. Yeah. So, you know, when this whole Russia-Ukraine war happened, I got crushed. Because people pulled into a Luke Oil gas station and this is just, you know, people are just uneducated and they don't know. It's, it's not their fault. They just don't know better. People, oh, Luko, it's a Russian station. Oh, we're not giving them business. Schmuck. I'm the owner. This is my business. You think, you think Luke Oil, the main company of Luke Oil in Moscow, is affected by you not filling your car here? No, me and my family are. You know? Actually, they just won with everything that went on because of, of our current administration's things that they changed that actually made Russia more successful right. in oil and gas business, but like you don't want to, people associate Russian oil with a Russian name on a, on a gas station, which is completely wrong. Luke Oil is Russian? It's a Russian company. However, Luke Oil North America. I just say it sounds Middle Eastern. I don't know. Maybe it's, it's from Russia. It, their, their, main, their main company, their original company is in Moscow. I'm joking. And then, I know you are. I got you, I got you here. <laughs> and they spun off to Luke Oil North America, which is, let's say, 300 employees. And they're all, like, their offices are on Park Avenue and in, like, South Jersey somewhere. So the oil that comes in, and I know I'm kind of going all over the place, but it's all right. everybody's going crazy about Russian oil, right? The United States imports a, a ton of oil from different places all, all over. One of those places was Russia. Now, when oil come, crude oil comes into this country, it has to go through a refinery, a refining process, right? Was it cheaper under Trump? I think it was a little, just, just a touch. And was that because of using our natural resources? I'm, I'm asking uh, for somebody in the business. Yes, yeah, so, so a lot of reasons why it was cheaper. One of the main reasons was, you know, we had, we were energy independent and we had access to it in what our backyard. What does energy independent mean to you? Uh, it means that we are very capable of producing our own oil that we can refine into gas and petroleum and... Um, Is we, it right to say that we, we really probably have the, the biggest reserves in the world? Yeah, in my opinion, I think so, yeah. yeah. And there's no, the rest of the world is, is, we're making other countries rich right now by, by begging them to, to buy like their Saudi oil. Saudi Arabia. And we have, and you got, a, and you got, a, you got a, an ocean of oil in your backyard, and you're not tapping into it. Mm -hmm. Why? 
you know, and a lot of people are hurting financially and, and they're getting killed, killed over it and it's, it's not right and it's not fair. So I, I jumped in, which is my sure. fault, but you're talking about crude oil coming in to the country. Yeah, so we import crude, you know, daily from multiple different places, Canada, Russia, wherever. And it goes through a refining process, refinery process. And once it's refined into gasoline, it's then distributed out to distributors who then distribute it to gas stations. Bringing Russian oil into, United, into the United States, I agree, like we don't, need to bring, we don't need to bring Russian oil, fine, cut them off, right? But by, by people boycotting a Russian name on a sign, it does nothing but hurt a local business guy. You know, I, I am, you know, I'm Steve Cortaposi, born in Brooklyn, born in Brooklyn, raised in Marlboro, New Jersey. Creek. You know, I have a, it's, I'm, I'm Italian, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, this guy is Greek. I just threw you off. I know you did. <laughs> so, um, I'm, I'm, I'm an American, you yeah. know what I'm saying? And you shouldn't, I, you shouldn't hurt or I hinder my family's ability to pay their bills and eat and live. And that's basically what's happening. Is and, and people, so once, once that oil comes into the country and it goes through the refining process, refinery process, you don't know where that oil came from. So like, if you go to a get Exxon. So how does Luke Oil know that you purchased through them? Because they all send their distributors or I'll order my fuel through their distributors. But their distributors already have refined gas or refined oil. So it already, already went through the funnel of crude oil. It already went through the funnel. So they don't know. The dist- so by the time it gets to my tanks and my ground. Yeah. Who the hell knows where this is from? knows where it came from. So could be Saudi Arabia. It could be Iraq. Anywhere. Yeah. You know, so nobody really knows. So the Exxon down the street that you're boycotting me for, it's got Russian oil in it too. Original, originally. Yeah. You know? So that, um, and people think that, people have this misconception that they're giving money to a foreign entity. Again, I totally understand it. Um, but that's just not the case, you know, and it, and it, 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 it took a little bit of a toll, you know, and it hurt. Yeah. But, um, like we were talking before, I, I would use these go as- out on a limb and say that those people were being, uh, potentially misled by the left. Um, yeah. uh, they may be great people and they thought that they were doing something good for the Ukrainian people, but fortunately, uh, CNN lied to them. Big time. And they're, you know, there's a lot of sheep out there and not enough lions, right? Lions not sheep. Shout out to Sean Whalen. Shout out to Sean Whalen. Follow him on, on the socials. He's great. But, um, you know, there's a lot of people that take, and there's a, a ton of misinformation out there, which is why social media is toxic. And I've said that before. It's a lot of smoke and mirrors and big dog and pony show. And um, people take that as gospel. You know, they take, they take some of that stuff as... Yeah, people listen to me like I'm gospel. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking I mean, about. I don't, know, I don't know what they're thinking. <laughs> I'm just a guy drinking beers. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> you don't know shit. It's Evan. It's actually all Evan. Evan's the man with the brain. Evan's the man with the plan. That's right. He's the nice guy. He makes me look good. Poor Evan. He's got to be up early tomorrow. <laughs> Poor Evan. He's got to make me look good. <laughs> <laughs> Tough task, pal. Good luck with that. So but, you, um, you had struggles during, you know, obviously the the Ukraine war. And, uh, and again, I don't want to just jump ahead. We're talking a lot about gas, and I think that's an interesting topic because dude, I won't lie. <laughs> I'll roll up to a gas station and the dude with, with, with a towel on his head, yeah. and I don't mean any type of bad No, way, no, I got it. Uh, you know, he's, you know, hey, how you doing, sir? And I'm like, what the fuck is up with this course? <laughs> like, call your cousin. <laughs> Tell him we need to... <laughs> Out the cause. This is a very immature Ryan. No, know? no. It, it, <laughs> this is, you know, 10 plus years ago. But, you know, I think that that was uh, a cool topic to go over. I really do. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. So moving along. So you, you, you get rid of one, lack of staff, you're yeah. down to two. Yeah, I have right now. I have Wall and Tom's River. Wall is the uh, is the uh, the baby, I guess you want to call it. It's the it's the it's a very very busy station. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it does well, and um, you know you have to be creative in these times. And I think that that's something that for me, that's what I focus on. Right, like we were talking before about finding those those advantages or finding that edge during these tougher times. I like that because I use you know some of my background to be creative. When other people are like, oh, boo-hoo. Like give me an example. You know, like house accounts, right? So what's a house, that what's that? What's a house account? A house account is, I will go to a local business, right? 
um, let's say like a trucking company, like a Sunbelt or United Rentals or something like that with, you know, They come fill your trucks. truck up through, I'll give you a 10% discount. Exactly. I'll say, you know, I'll walk in, you know, I'll put myself together. I'll walk in and say, hey, you know, can I, have your, can I speak to your operations suit manager? from the mortgage business? What's that? Three-piece suit you walk exactly. in? Exactly, exactly. Three-piece suit all the way up, tail of the suit, manicure the whole nine. And I speak to the operations manager, whatever, and they're kind of like taken back because they're not used to having a gas station owner come up and, and you know, pitch them, so to speak. And I'll sit down in their office and I'll talk to them and I'll, I'll give them advantages of why that they should fill up with me or, you know, and guarantee that they'll put all their trucks through, you know, through my station. And um, I'll make a deal with them and, and I'll build that relationship with them. So that's my creative How side. How hard is that? So, for example, I, I know those particular ones that you just read off, but let's just say uh, a, a delivery company, you know, they're on the road anywhere so they could fill up at you but now they're out 400 miles later you know how does that work is it like a definite contract where they have to fill up no, at there's you? no gun to their head where they have to do it but i'll tell them hey you know you know i'll start the conversation with how much you spend in a month in gas on your fleet uh we spend about x amount of dollars how many trucks you have we have this amount of trucks okay have your trucks fill up in the morning with me every single day and if you're what you're telling me that you're doing is true and you continually, you're consistent with those numbers, I'll give you this this, this, discount, this discount. I'll float you for the month, I'll send you an invoice at the end of the month, and I'll take, you know, whatever it is off, off the bill based on your, based on your, your yeah, so they're, they're recovering cash. Yeah. And they're, they're happy to get the discount, but if they, if they don't do what they're telling me to, and I tell them straight up, I say, we're having a conversation, right? You're telling me that you spend $10,000 a month in fuel, if you start doing $1,500, $2,000 in fuel, you're not getting this discount. Mm-hmm. I'll give you a good discount. I'll give you, you know, good money. You got to bring X amount of revs in, right? You know, and and I'm 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 a spreadsheet guy. I'm again, I worked in finance. I, I you know, everything's Excel. So I have, I have a lot of formula driven stuff going you know, on. Spreadsheets and don't tell you everything, right? They don't. They don't. Exactly. They don't That's why you, you need marry. to have both. They can't say there was a pandemic. They can't no tell you certain things. They cannot. But I'm on site every day, so. I, in one hand, I have a nozzle, and the other hand, I'm on the keyboard. Yeah, does that make I get sense? It. Yeah, totally. So I think that is it's a Your good. Your finger tool. is completely on the pulse, always. And so if there was something about gas, gas stations, that people aren't really aware of, and again, we we touched on a couple different things that they probably weren't aware of, but like your main thing, what would it be? At the, that they're not aware of. Yeah, like like owning, operating, profitability, whatever it may be. Your margins are super thin. You make pennies, literally pennies on a dollar, and it's it's a volume game. And when you see that guy walking around with a knot of money, you know, it's the knot's that big. That much is going back to the oil company to, to mm-hmm. pay for that that truck of fuel. A truck of fuel that you see you see a hundred of them a day driving down. You know, if if you had a guess how much that truck of fuel costs. How many gallons is it? Eight thousand gallons, eight eight to nine thousand gallons, depending depending on the type of truck. Gun to your head. Twenty thousand dollars. How much? Twenty. One more time. Twenty. How much? Twenty thousand. Yeah. Try forty. Yeah. Forty grand. I think that was a pretty good guess. Yeah, it was a great guess. You're only off by half. But. <laughs> fifty fifty in baseball is pretty good. <laughs> That's right. But uh, you know, so it's it's a lot of money, and, and those the oil company wants their money in th- in three days. Wow. So you get a you they, get a load of take fuel. Amex. You get a load of fuel today, by hook or by crook, three days from now. They're getting paid. Now, if you get a can blizzard, you pay with that with a credit card? Say again. Can you pay for gas with a credit card? No, it's like they, like they have a link to your bank account and they direct debit out of your account. Yeah. So you have to come up with that money. Did I get that thing? It was on your knee. What was that? Uh, something. I, I don't do bugs, man. So that's that's. Uh, Hope it gets you next. Yeah. Fuck. You'll see me running around screaming. So. And we, we, we're going on for an hour and a half because the two of us are like, squirrel, squirrel. Yeah, you know? Squirrel. <laughs> and Point. I, I love that, though. It's, great, I, it's a great movie, yeah. I hope other people love that about the show. That Me too. I have zero script. Zero. Um, That's the best part of the show. Most people don't believe me, actually, when I say that. I, I didn't believe it at first, either. I didn't. And, and you and many other people recently have said I'm a great interview. And I really, really, I, I'm happy you tell me that because I'm very hard on myself. Uh, I stress myself out trying to be really good and you shouldn't be because you're you're it's something that what you're doing it's it's a good thing that you've done and it's 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 provided good great really good content 
not to stroke your ego, but it's it's a, it's a yeah. you're well you're good at what you do, and I, I I hope that this goes on for a very very long time because I, I really enjoy it. They're eventually gonna come for me, you know. I mean, but thanks. I'm ready. I'm glad you know that. Yeah, I'm ready for it. Um, so you're talking about you know it's shit, it's forty thousand dollars to bring in a truckload of gas. Yeah. What type of gross revenues are your gas stations doing in total? You know, peak good seasons. You know, obviously, you know the the busiest one is in Wall. Um, summertime is the busiest time, which is great. Everything's going good. You know, with house accounts and things like that. It, gross rev, you know, it, it it varies, but you're in like the twenty five thousand per day range. That's huge. You know, yeah, it's good. You know, which is why it needs to be that, so you can make to get your profits. Yeah, right? you have to. You know, you have to make that type of money. You have to pay for your fuel. Winter time is a rough profit margin on that. What's that? Give us a rough profit margin. So I go, we go by WAM, right? Weighted average margin. So it, it's a it's a margin based over the products that you sell, regular plus premium and diesel. Your profit margin on regular is like this. WAM is a cool world that word that most people probably haven't heard. Most people don't know what WAM is. And um, the person who taught me about the the gas business taught me about WAM and um, actually the <laughs> the guy I bought the stations from and. It was, um, he's an accountant by trade. His father owned the stations and he grew up in, in the gas business and he's a CPA, but he grew up with the gas business, which so I related to him immediately. Cause it's rare that you're a CPA and an entrepreneur. Very rare. Cause those guys are usually very, <laughs> very rare. So he was a big, big numbers guy. And he showed me all the spreadsheets. So in the deal, when I bought the stations, I, I put some, I had the attorney put something that he has to stay on as like a, like a mentor or like a coach for um, like 60 days or 90 days, something like that. They revised it, they said, no, we're only staying on 30 days. Fine. Five years ago, I talked to him every day. Still, to this day. Yeah, he ended up liking you. Loves me, like we're, we're like close yeah. friends. And um, he Shout really- Shout out to that guy for yeah. it, par, uh, turning Perry. around and, and bringing the next guy up the ladder, which is again, what Fireside is about. He was so cool, like, he didn't have to do that and he, and, and he really did. So um, he taught me wham, wham is a very important number. Um, you want to make, if you're going to be in the gas business, you want to, your wham you want to be about um, 25 cents per gallon. I didn't say 25 percent, it's 25 cents per gallon. That's mm -hmm. a big, that's a big way to look at it. Yeah. It's always, do, it's always, you know, dollars or cents per yeah. gallon. So if you can run that volume, if you can get that consistency and the volume, it's a great living. So yeah. location. It is key. Yeah, after your gas is paid, you want to make about twenty-five cents per gallon. That's that's what you're that's what you're looking for. So, you know, the gas business is not being terrible for you. Right, it's a, that's why it's a volume game. Though. You have yeah. to you have to pump a lot of fuel, and then you have other things like, you know, you know the chips, the the waters, the drinks, where your margins on those on those items are much better. Do you yeah. have a little store with your wall one? So the wall one has, it doesn't have a store. Like I have, I have a couple of fridges there. Now I feel obligated to drive all the way to wall for gas. I mean, if you don't start fuel, filling up, I take it personally, if people I know that pass by and, oh, I just drove by. I said, oh wait, you drove by, you didn't get gas? Yeah. Well, you know, I had Did three Did you find your planning? Did you call me? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little, little, little bit of a conflict of interest. I got family in, the, uh, in that industry, Fuck so I might them. get yelled at. <laughs> You can't trust family, especially Italians. I, I hear you, man. I hear you. We're shy <laughs> sons, of, sons of bitches. But, um, but yeah, it's... Uh, th so there's a couple of fridges where I have like some drinks and stuff. And I have a couple of racks with like chips and snacks. And believe it or not, it it, it, it does like... It, it adds up. Do you go to Costco for that? What's that? You go to Costco for that? So some things I do, um, I'll go to Restaurant Depot, I'll go to Costco, I'll go to... Um, yeah. I have vendors, you know, because sometimes I'm too Don't busy. Don't even mess with the vendors. If you could just go grab that stuff, the compound effect on the it's, small margin. There. I hear you. It's tough, though, because it's yeah, like, time. You know, it's time, man. It's run. A run to Costco takes an hour and a half out of my day. Mm -hmm. You know, so if I'm doing that and it's, you know, something happens, I have to be back and I'm in aisle six of Costco, you know, it's, it takes some time. So you, you've been able to turn the gas station business, as what you've learned about it, into a success and you're giving your family a good lifestyle. Yeah. You then say, I want to start doing some meal prepping. Mm -hmm. And I don't like to give too many meal prep guys besides Coronado, who will be on the show soon, and Jamie, because this business is getting quickly saturated, as I'm sure you're well aware. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's, it's too saturated. When did you say, like, I want to start... Prepping meals on top of running around the gas stations and like, it, walk me through that quickly. So the meal prep company came when with CKO, with my um, 
who is my partner in the meal prep company, Gina. Um, she was my manager at the gym and all this meal prep stuff was going on and I knew Jamie for years and shout out to Jamie because he, he had a vision. He did, did a beautiful thing and when it was like, it was not cool to do so. It's easy for anybody now to get into that yeah. business. Um, not really easy, but it's, it's, it's easy to kind of take that leap because there's been so many people who have done it. Jamie was, in my eyes, the first one really who did it and he did it well. Mm. You know, he didn't have fear, he kind of just drove in. Maybe he had some fear, I don't know, but he dove in and, and he absolutely crushed it and he continues to crush it. And there's a reason why he's in the position he's in today um, because of his actions. He may be willing to buy you if you're open. Hey, shit, sure, sure. let's go, I'm ready. <laughs> it's tough, man, it's tough. It's, now, are you cooking yourself? Are you, yeah, oh are yeah, you man, I'm, like, what we, are you doing? Like, you know, we, <laughs> that, like, literally, chopping peppers and onions and things like that. You know, I don't have the, I don't have the bandwidth like Jamie does. And um, it's a- You're chopping the onions yourself? Oh yeah, man. I, I'm, I'm a great cook. What are you cook. doing? I'm Italian, man. What are you doing? I don't know how to cook. That's the problem. You gotta get your mom to chop the onions. I know, seriously. Like, come on. Is there Chef. onions in her meatballs? Is there onions in what's her, her meatballs? What's her recipe on I meatballs? can't be crazy. I can tell you my mother's recipe. You nuts. <laughs> Fuck, just kill me. I thought I could set you up. Just kill me dead. Um, Where, are you doing it out of your house? Or no, you commercial it? kitchen, man. I have a big commercial kitchen space and it's, it's great, but the I, problem I think now, a part of Jamie's concept is like, he's going to allow, like, like he did it. I know Coronado did it. I know a lot of these other small meal prep companies. There's a few of them, Atlantic Highlands. There's, there's a girl I met, Kettlebells. There's another brick kid. Yeah, there, I mean, there's a ton there, of them, There's man. a bunch they, of them. They're, they're all over. And, and, and all of them do something different, and they're all actually you know, pretty cool. But they all started off in a kitchen. I think his new concept is something like, I'm very generalizing, but like, hey, yo, come utilize my systems um, and brand it under Eat Clean Bro. I, I don't smart, know how that's man. gonna it's work. Smart, it's yeah. smart, I mean, listen, it, it, it's got a pretty it, cool facility. Evan and I went and checked it out. I'd love to see it. I'm sure it's very impressive. Um, I, have an, I have a nice kitchen, but it's, it's, it's nothing like that. Where are you doing it out of? West Orange. And, um, so that's another thing. You drive all the way up there. Yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm all over the state, man. It's, it's, you know. And, and but the problem with this industry, and which is why Jamie is, is probably in a, a better situation than most people right now in that business, because a case of chicken used to cost me 65 bucks. Now a case of chicken is 130 bucks. Mm -hmm. And if God willing, straight will, doubled. It, it's, it's insane. And food margins. And someone who could really speak well to this is Matt Cangelosi when he come, when he comes on. Matt, you're coming ice on. Ice cream is expensive. Yeah. I, dude, his and he's got he's he's not Produce, just an ice cream shop. Eggs. He's got a full restaurant. You yeah, know, he's got a cheeseburger. Oh, he, I mean, he makes fantastic burgers and 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 a bunch of different foods. I'm gonna have to be a judge of this. Listen, maybe we'll film it. We Go should. There, burgers. We should. Who do you think you are? Dave Portnoy? You're going to do a review? Uh, yeah, I'm going to get Tobias involved. He goes to a lot of food places. He's coming on. Matt, Matt's food, Matt's burgers, dogs, and, and cheese steaks are, I'll put it up with anything. It's, it's, it's fan his food is fantastic. It really is. And his ice cream is even better. But um, he, we talk about it a lot because he's in the same industry. He's got a huge warehouse where he houses like his, his, um, his food and stuff. And Smart. When, when you're, when you're, um, when your costs go up double in that industry, it's virtually impossible to make money. Yeah, it's so, hard to pass that on. Like, yeah. You just won't have people buying it. I'm, I'm, I'm this in Jamie's world of this. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's so for him. So he think, can absorb that. So that, thinking that, like, do you wanna do you wanna continue doing that business? Um, Is it really that profitable? <laughs> you know. It, it, it Am start, I on the spot? No, no, it's fine, and it's 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 all good, and this is this is what the pit's about, right? It's we want real talk, it, real talk. talk. You know, it's it's gotten to a point where it was a passion thing, and it's a, it's very very hard work, and I'm not afraid of the hard work, but when it gets to a point where it's you're working for nothing, for nothing, you know, it, it's again, you know, Jamie's been so long into this business, and. It, it sometimes just doesn't really make sense anymore. And yeah. I think part of being a good business person is being knowing- Being okay walking away. You can hold on to a bad, a bad business, you know, and your, your pride, pride is a, is a messed up thing. Yeah, you know, it, it your pride you. can bury you, you know, and you need to be, you need to have enough pride to say, hey man, you know, this is- <laughs> You have to be open to constructive criticism. Yeah. And that's not an easy thing to do, especially when you're an alpha male. Yeah. Or it sucks. female. 
it sucks saying, hey, you know, maybe we didn't really hit a home run on this one. You know, and, uh, but that's okay. And there's no, you know, it's cliche to say, yo, failures are good, good, and, you know, when you fail, it sucks. When you're not, you know, you're not the top of something, it sucks. Well, I think, you know, hearing your story tonight and, and almost you being that serial entrepreneur, which mm-hmm. is cool, like, you're unafraid to keep taking risk. Yeah, like okay. I said again earlier, I said that. You're unafraid to try something new. I'll never go back to working for a company or working for something. I, and I, dude, I, I could. I said I said it earlier today. My friend Madison and, and her husband Rob was over. Stopped by to see my wife and my daughter. I said a, a, a corporate company, if they were to suck me up in the industry, and they probably never would, because you know I'm always knocking on the door of compliance, or compliance is always knocking on my door. You, know, you would have to pay me two million dollars guaranteed to give up my, my flexibility and my freedom, amount of money. to never have to sell, have someone tell me what to do. Yeah. And that is a part of like something I have wrong with me. Like yeah. self-admittedly, like I don't fucking like- There's nothing wrong with that. Anybody telling me what to do. Like I do not like that. I, I had this conversation with somebody recently and I said one of my picks, I do not want to be told what to do. And that's okay. It's who we are, right? Yeah. As alpha males, we have people, fine. But you better be able to succeed in life being on yeah. your own and doing that. Because yeah. some people need that direction. They need to be told, hey, you're gonna get up, your day is gonna look like this. Totally fine. I don't want to Worker bees. I don't, you know, we, me and Mike Sclafani laugh a lot, and because people used to always come in the gyms and say, you know what you should do? What yeah. should I do? Yeah. Yeah. Tell me. I didn't think of that one. You know what I should do? That's, that's it's a, it's, and there, there's nothing bad about it. It's, it's people are being, trying to be helpful, but you know, until, and I keep that in mind when I speak to other business owners. I don't. Know, I haven't walked a day in their chucks. You know, I haven't walked a day in their shoes. I don't know anything about their business. But this is what I'm saying. This is what I think. Right. And but but who am I to tell you what you should do? Mm-hmm. You know. I mean, yeah. I, if you want my advice, you'll ask for it. But you know, it's. Um, you know, again, I don't know where we're going with that. But it's it's a being an entrepreneur is a special type of a person, and working for you know a big company is another special type of person. So rounding this all out, mm-hmm. I'd like to ask two questions. One, first question being, if you could tell a young entrepreneur, a person looking to leave corporate, or an entrepreneur, one thing, what would it be? Do what you love and the money will follow. Have passion in what you do, and you'll be a very rich person or a successful person or whatever your definition of success is. And I mean that wholeheartedly. I, for too long of a time, I, I did what I thought I should be doing, and I wasn't doing what, what sparked Naturally my- came to you. Yeah, I wasn't doing what like really like, like lit my fire, mm-hmm. you know? And um, I, I, I really believe that. If you do something forced, you're not gonna be good at it. Mm-hmm. You're just not, you know? So find something you really love to do and, and run with it. So we talked about Mike, we talked about Jersey Freeze. Enough about Mike. Two other business owners that you would love to give a shout out in your area. Um, or around here. Yeah, so since we talked about Mike and Matt already and they got enough love, um, I'll talk about my brother James. He owns uh, Litigation. It's a litigation support firm. He's got a, he's got a law background and he's like, uh, he's, um, he's a fantastic, he's fantastic in his field. So he does a, lit- a full litigation support company and um, he's, he's like a mentor to me too. Where's he located? He lives in Millstone and uh, he's got offices in Newark, but he, he works all over. He, he does business. Nationally or statewide? Um, he's done national, some national stuff, like, you know, as far as Texas, I think he's gone. Yeah. Um, but most of his stuff is in Jersey. Um, you know, anything that you can think of, if people in that field, I, I mean, I can't even tap into that because yeah. I really don't know. But he's he's very good at what he does. Good. Shout out to your brother next. Yes. Another one. And I have to, again, give give Gina Haskup um, from Your Whimsy World. She's She does beautiful work and, you know, I give her a, a ton of credit. And she's she's really really great at, at her job, and um, she does really beautiful work. So I'm very happy for her success. Well, dude, this has been fun. We have been all over the map, but I, I think there really was some great nuggets. Yeah. Um, the gas station, um, the hedge fund, private equity world. People are interested, man. A, yeah. a lot of times, like we can all try to read about certain things that we're not an expert in, and it can confuse the shit. Out. I sat with a client today for three hours on a product that I know really, really well, and there was like this hiccup happening that I could not figure out why, and we got like 10 experts on the phone to do so. So if I don't know an industry and I'm trying to read about it, but I don't know the basic definitions of them, 
how am I going to really truly understand what that industry is about, uh, what they're doing. So to talk about the gas business, to talk about you know private equity and hedge funds a little bit more. Uh, yeah, my my wife tells me I'm all over the place, and uh, and she's not wrong. But uh, you know, she she's put up with a lot throughout the years, and it's it's a lot it's a lot to digest, and it's a lot to go around. But and again, I shout out shout out to to Monica. Uh, my wife is again battling. Shout out to kids. your wife for putting up with you in this. This is, I mean, she's 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 a gem. Shout out to Evan for putting up with us as well. Evan too. <laughs> Poor Evan. <laughs> Evan's gonna get like a quick nap in before his uh, his busy day tomorrow. All right. Thanks, Roy. Appreciate Good it. Good stuff. Man.